Good afternoon. I'm Betty Ford, and I'm an alcoholic. Betty Ford's decision to take her recovery public was an incredible example of using sort of her own personal tragedy really for a higher purpose of, of serving others and serving this country. The fact that she represented the ability of a regular person to take control of their own lives and, and change your life and, and make it healthier, make it better. And what a role model especially when it's the First Lady of the United States. When I saw the, the respect that she and the President had for each other and the love for each other, uh, it changed my marriage, it changed my life, it changed everything about me. In her candor and in her very style, she, I think, uh, transmitted courage to those women across this country to speak up about what troubled them, uh, what their opinions were, and what their place in this country should be. Betty Ford has made her mark as someone who faced her problems head on, dealt with them, and served as an example to all of us. I was awestruck by her courage and her description of the fact that this was a disease and that we could get better. When she believes something, she goes after it or there would never be a Betty Ford Center. The spirit of Betty's presence pervades the whole place. As a matter of fact, it's almost that uh, whether a person knows Betty or not, when she's here, everybody knows there's something different about the place. That is, she's here. The stigma that's attached to alcoholism uh, is the same as, uh, as it's attached to mental health. And, and Betty, more than any other human being, has reduced that, that stigma and made it possible for people to be treated. Betty Ford has left her mark for life on making life better for others. Betty Bloomer is my oldest and dearest friend. We met when we were eight years old at dancing school. She was always the prettiest, she was always the best dancer, and the most remarkable thing about Betty is that of all the people I have ever known, she is the only person of whom no unkind word has ever been said. Beautiful, graceful, and athletic, Betty Bloomer was the belle of Grand Rapids. My dad used to tell stories about, you know, he'd go over to see her and as he was walking in one door, another one was walking out the back door. So she was very popular from what I understand. By the time she met Gerald Ford, the most eligible bachelor in Grand Rapids, Betty had already spent a year dancing with Martha Graham in New York and had been married and divorced. Ford was a lawyer, but had other plans he was keeping to himself. When mom said, yes, she would marry dad, he said, you know, I got a secret, I, I can't tell you. And, and she said, didn't know what it was. And the, the secret was he was gonna run for Congress. And she swears to this day, if she'd known she was gonna marry a politician, she would have said no. But a politician's wife is what she became. While her husband served in Congress, Betty was at home raising their four children. She was certainly, uh the parent who was around most to uh, crack the whip, discipline us, uh, those kinds of things. And so uh, to her fell the, the tougher role. In our household, dad was on the road a lot, you know, at least 100 nights a year. Mom was the one that was home making sure we got our homework done, you know, got to football practice, you know, saw the dentist, all those kind of things. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. August 9th, 1974. Richard Nixon became the only president in our nation's history to resign. After 26 years as a congressman's wife, Betty Ford was thrust into the national spotlight. Mr. Vice President, are you prepared to take the oath of office as president of the United States? I am, sir. I used to walk by the White House just like everybody else, and I'd look through the gate and wonder what the heck they do in there. And then nobody could have told me 
the events that were going to happen in history in the next 10 months, Agnew resigning, Dad becoming Vice President, Nixon resigning, that would catapult us overnight to the White House. Suddenly, the family was under the scrutiny of an entire nation. People were fascinated by the new First Lady's clothes, her hair, and her candor. I do not believe that being First Lady should prevent me from expressing my ideas. Less than two months after becoming First Lady, the country learned about another side of Betty Ford, her courage. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer and bravely revealed that to the world. My husband had only been in office uh, for about six weeks when my cancer was diagnosed. And at that time, and when he was sworn into office, as he made his statement, he said, there will be no more cover-up. There will be no more camouflage. And we discussed it as a family that maybe the best thing to do was be absolutely forthcoming and say, my wife has had a mastectomy. She had cancer, and she's had a mastectomy. People have a hard time remembering this now, but before Betty Ford, breast cancer was kind of a dirty little secret in America. Women didn't talk about it. Uh, Families didn't get involved in the treatment of it. Um, uh, we didn't deal with it much on television news. She changed all that. One day like that, and the next day I was in the hospital. And I thought, there are women all over the country like me. And if I don't make this public, then their lives will be gone. They're in jeopardy. And I think it did a great deal for women as far as the cancer problem is concerned. This was a revelation. It really had never happened before. And with it, she began a movement of patient empowerment, advocacy, information, and a real desire to create uh, a prevention and a cure of this disease. Typical, consistent, I think, for Mrs. Ford was that she just went public, as always with Betty Ford, tell it like it is, just be honest. And she went public and said, hey, ladies, go get checked, get mammograms, find out, you can save your own lives. That candor, first evident in the revelation of her breast cancer, became her hallmark and defined her time as the nation's first lady. The question on abortion, that is a matter of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court made the ruling, and the Supreme Court is the law of our land. I feel that the Equal Rights Amendment ought to probably pass. Betty Ford's comments have stirred up reaction from London to Manila. The outcry over Betty Ford's candor eventually turned to admiration, and before long, her popularity soared beyond even the president's. But when Gerald Ford lost his bid for re-election, their short time in the White House came to an end. The President urges all Americans to join him in giving your united support to President-elect Carter as he prepares to assume his Betty found herself in their new home in Rancho Mirage, California, facing the most difficult transition of her life. She had left Washington, she had a life there, she had moved to California. Yes, they had friends there. She was building a house, her husband wasn't home. Um, she was in major adjustment, very difficult adjustment. Um, and doctors weren't saying no to her. She went in and said, I have an ache and a pain and a whatever, and it was another prescription. We were um, very typical of any American family. Uh, we we knew how to be in denial just like everybody else. And uh, we were in denial. We, we saw our mother slipping away. We, we, you know, whether it be slurred speech or not going out as often. I saw it when I came back from college and visited and, and the falling and the, she chipped a tooth and things like that. And, um, and she was covering it up, but she was lonely. She was very lonely. I did begin to withdraw, not only withdraw from my family, but I canceled appointments, I withdrew from my friends. Uh, it was almost as if I uh, kind of went into my bedroom and pulled the shades down. Little did I know at that time, they were talking behind my back, 
what are we going to do about mother? The family knew something had to be done. So President Ford organized a formal intervention in the family living room and enlisted the help of two doctors, Joe Persh and Joe Cruz, and a nurse, Pat Benedict. Dr. Persh and I walked in, and she did not know who we were. And she kind of looked at us. And I thought, well, we'll have to see how this goes. President Ford sat her down on the couch, facing all of us. Now, I began to panic because I had not talked to my colleague, are you going to run the intervention, or am I going to run the intervention? Are you going to start, or am I going to start? Well, none of that worry was necessary because President Ford put his arm around her and said, Mom, these people are all here because we love you, and we want you to listen to us, and then you'll be able to say what you want to say. Mike, you start. And President Ford ran the intervention. You know, Dad was wonderful because he sat Mom down and he took her hand and said, we're here because, um, because we love you, Mom, and we, I want my wife back. And, and uh, the kids want their mother back. And, um, and he held her hand, she was scared, and we went around the room and started telling those stories. And, and um, you know, they're hard stories to tell because you're really kind of being tough on somebody. Stories of when she was uh, slurring her speech, stories of when she would start dozing off and falling asleep, uh, or when she would uh, stumble um, and not be able to stand um, by herself. She needed support. Um, memory loss, uh, times when she would not recognize uh, people that she should, should know. And these things were very hard to, for her to hear and, and hard for us to say. It was painful. It was very painful. I still, you know, when I walk in their living room now, that's, that scene still sticks in my head. It's just a difficult scene to watch your mother crumble. And I was shocked by it. You were and in this I room? Was in this room, indeed. They went from one to another saying how I had let them down, how I had disappointed them. And of course, this just was cutting to me. I was so hurt. I felt I had spent my whole life devoted to them, and they were telling me I was failing them. It'll be a day we'll never forget, but let me say this very affirmatively. It was the only thing that saved Betty's life. I drove up with her to the Navy hospital, and uh, we went down to the four-bedroom room, and um, that didn't go over too well. <laughs> And I thought, well, uh, we've come this far. And uh, she didn't want to stay. She did not want to stay in a four bedroom. But she did stay. For 30 days, Betty underwent treatment at the Long Beach Naval Hospital. She scrubbed toilets, made her bed, went to meetings, and shared a room with three other women. That experience would one day influence many of Betty's decisions when it came time to create a treatment center of her own. At that time, though, there was just one critical decision to make. I remember putting my arm around her, and I said, Betty, you know, we've brought you this far. I'm not going to drop you. I'm just not going to drop you. And uh, then she said, release it to the press. My opinion when she did that, she opened the door for women to seek treatment. This country loved this woman, and the enormous respect and affection that they had for her just, just magnified the impact of her announcement. It, it, it brought home in a way that I'm not sure anything else could, that this disease could virtually touch any family in this country. She wasn't parading around saying, I'm the first lady of the United States. She's just Betty Ford person, and I'm facing up to my addiction, and I'm going to beat this thing, and if I can beat it, you can beat it. What a role model. What a legacy. One year after emerging from the Naval Hospital, Betty was called to assist in the intervention of one of her best friends, 
Leonard Firestone. Realizing she could actually make an impact in another alcoholic's recovery, Betty and Leonard started talking about a treatment center as soon as he had completed rehab. Why did you decide, Betty, to uh, start the Betty Ford Center? As I got into recovery, I had so many requests from so many people writing me, sending telegrams and calling, saying, how did you do it? And I became aware of the need for others to kind of understand what I had learned in treatment. With the guiding vision of Dr. Joe Cruz, they raised $6 million in three years. Betty was able to get pledges on cocktail napkins in the jets coming back from Las, Las Vegas when the whole group of them had been up seeing a show up there. She knew to wait, not get the pledge on the way up, but get the pledge on the way back. Smart lady. The visions that came to Mrs. Ford, I like to think of it as a divine appointment. These ideas came to her and she could see the overall picture just like Joe Cruz could. Uh, Joe brought me here and uh, he says, come on, Sam, you've got to see this. This was all sand. <laughs> this was all sand, desert. He says, the energy is here, Sam. He says, can you imagine a more beautiful place to get sober? And I looked at him and I said, Joe, I can't imagine a better place. In October of 1981, they broke ground and out of the desert rose their dream. Betty participated in every phase of planning and construction. But the most important decision she ever made seems now to be the most obvious. She was approached about having her name on it. And Mrs. Ford said, absolutely not. I'm too new in recovery. Um, that's that's uh, really over the top. Um, I don't think it's smart for me. I don't think it's smart for the center. So in the early days of the planning, of this center, it was called the Chemical Dependency Treatment Center at Eisenhower Medical Center. Indeed, there was a great deal of reluctance to have my name on it. I knew it would be a certain responsibility as far as the name was concerned. Finally, President Ford and Leonard Firestone convinced her that, Betty, you put your name on it, it will change the accessibility, the access that women need to have to get help. Betty Ford's role has been prime in this thing. Not only her name, but her presence here plays a role in the, uh, in the treatment of everybody that comes through here. And everything you see here is Mrs. Ford. She did the decorating, she did the choosing of the fabrics, she chose the furniture, she chose the rugs. The week before we opened our doors, she actually dragged Secret Service agents with her to Kmart because she realized walking around that we didn't have soap dishes in the patient's room. And um, so she went out and bought soap dishes. She was always and still is involved in what colors should be here. What do those colors say about making people feel welcome? The men and women who come here basically have no self-esteem left. How do we begin to make them feel okay about themselves? How do we restore their dignity? And Mrs. Ford correctly saw that that environment you create is part of the way you do that. After months of construction, the vision and hard work of Mrs. Ford, Leonard Firestone, Dr. Jim West, and countless others culminated on October 3rd 1982 in a triumphant dedication ceremony. The Vice President of the United States and Mrs. George Bush escorted by President and Mrs. Gerald Ford. It felt so good to be in this huge tent where all these dignitaries were, including Betty, including President Ford, including President Bush. I just felt overwhelmed with gratitude. I speak of the hard work, and she did work hard, and she expected those working with her to work hard. <laughs> I remember early on, she called me about every day, 
Uh, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you followed up on this? And I think it was one day, I think it may have been the second or third call she gave me. I said, damn it, Betty, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> and I thought that might get her off me, but <laughs> it didn't. Uh, Mr. President, you're damn lucky. You're not an alcoholic. <laughs> This was a desert, rather, um, you know, a pile of sand out here. And we've made it come alive. But it's even going to be more alive for those people who come here for help. Because there is a way for them. And there is a new life for them. We don't ever have to give up. On October 4th, 1982, the Betty Ford Center opened its doors to its first five patients and began the work of healing mind, body, and soul. We say right out loud, and Mrs. Ford says it too, that this is a bio, psycho, social, spiritual disease, and all those aspects have to be dealt with in the treatment program. So we don't do it, spiritual care as just an afterthought. It's an integral part of what we do. Spirituality comes from the word spiritus, which means of breathing which means the essence of life. And so as we encourage patients to embrace religion, if that's what matters to them, we also encourage them to tap into their spirituality, their breath, their essence of life. Alcoholics and addicts suffer deeply from the grief and the shame and the loss of the disease, the inexorable decline, deterioration of themselves, their dignity, their humanity, their compassion, all dribbling away. And that's what is received at the gates of the treatment center, and that has to be recognized. I believe Mrs. Ford is a very spiritual person. It is seen throughout her touch on campus. When she's come and visited with patients, I've seen her love and acceptance and unconditional caring for patients all the way around. And those times when she's able to visit, it's amazing how just a, a hand touch from her allows people to feel connected to something greater than them. Another of Mrs. Ford's pioneering approaches to recovery is the treatment of alcoholism as a family disease. My family have been very supportive, and our family has not only been supportive of the center, but our whole family relationship has grown and enhanced tremendously since I received treatment. Uh, they have a great understanding of what it's all about, and um, we talk about my recovery and we talk about how they're involved too. October the 4th, 1982, the first two men and two women were admitted to the Betty Ford Center. That same day, which was a Monday, we began a family program. People criticized us for that saying, get your, pro your treatment program going first and then four to six to eight months you can get a family program going. And, and I kept standing up saying, you can't treat this disease without treating the family. To Mrs. Ford's credit, she backed that 100% and said, we're not gonna open until we're ready to do family program. She had a, an effect right from day one. My life before I came to the center was a life of fear and shame. My family was starting to get torn apart. I was actually a happy drunk, but in, the, in a heartbeat, I go from being real happy and I turn on you in two seconds, it just become mean and ugly. And at home, even when I wasn't drinking, when I walked in the house, nobody knew who was gonna come in, the, the happy, joyous dad, or the dad that was grumpy and mean and, and pissed off at the world. I was a real good enabler, so I just went right along with it and didn't wanna stir the pot, didn't wanna create any more chaos than was already there. So for me, um, I was very, I pulled back. I just kept trying to keep things as cool as it could, um, which of course now I know wasn't the best thing to do, but uh, at the time I was very fearful. Didn't want to didn't want to rock the boat, didn't want to create um, a question that might pull the rage out of him. If it wasn't for here, I'd be on the street somewhere probably, living in the gutter. Kathy going through the family program, it was a tremendous part of my sobriety. She was able to go in there and, and as I did, learn about the disease of alcoholism. Um, it's been able to help her cope with me. Um, 
and going through what I'm going through in my sobriety when I go up and when I go down. She she's un understands it a whole lot better. Um, she has an understanding of the disease. My 18-year-old daughter went through it as well. And for me, that was the hardest part, sitting across from my daughter and listening to her tell me what I've done to her and looking at this little, at the time she was 17, and looking in her eyes and seeing this little broken, you know, teenage girl. I mean, she just looked like a little baby to me that had been broken. That devastated me. Um, I'm happy to say that my daughter and I get along very well now, and that relationship is being rebuilt. My wife and I, our relationship's better than it's ever been. We can communicate now. In fact, I know that we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for us as a family working on the recovery process. If I would not have come to the Betty Ford Center, I would not have got sober. And had I not gotten sober, I would have lost my family. We would not be together as a family today. Mrs. Ford, I'm forever grateful um, for you starting this center giving us the opportunity to be part of it, to learn about alcoholism and the disease. You've helped our family tremendously and I thank you very much for it. If it wasn't for you and if it wasn't for the Betty Ford Center, who knows where life would take us. Early on, Mrs. Ford recognized that women in recovery face very different obstacles than men. And in 1988, the Betty Ford Center began a gender-specific treatment program for women. I wonder if there really would be a gender-specific program at the Betty Ford Center if it hadn't been for Mrs. Ford's particular commitment uh, to providing services particular to women and addressing women's needs. Another in the early days, a huge factor with Mrs. Ford was her increased feeling that our inpatient halls should be gender-specific. We had, in the beginning, quite a few women in the program. And because we had enough women, we had their group therapy separate. As we found the outcome studies that we took for later on, that women did much better in women's groups than they did in mixed groups. So she says, let's take a vote of the counselors, all the counselors on the campus. And the vote came back 18 to 18 about whether to go gender specific or keep it the way it was. Mrs. Ford said, I guess I get to break the tie. And she did. And in 1988, we'd been open almost six years, Mrs. Ford made the decision to go to gender specific. That has had a profound impact, not only on the Betty Ford Center, but on centers all over the United States. I started drinking when I was 14, shortly after I was using drugs, um, putting anything in my body to, I don't know, escape the moment. For me, it was all day, every day, as much as I could get. Whenever I could get it, I would use it. I had a pretty good facade going until my parents caught me lying, and they found drugs in my room, and they just knew, and I flat out said, if you stop me, I will run away, I will leave, and I won't come back. Because drugs, speed, alcohol, anything, it meant more to me than the people I love the most. You know? I, I just, I didn't care about anybody but getting my fix. It was so sad to me and to Kelly, it was this sense of hopelessness that, that there was nothing that we could do. There was this wall now that had been put up that the addiction had it, it, it put up that was way beyond what we could handle, what she could handle, and had changed her and was in the process of changing us. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop even if I wanted to, even if it meant my sister's heart was broken, my brother was so disappointed, my dad, my mom would cry every day, cry every night. At times I remember feeling like, I, I want my daughter back. This is not my daughter. I don't know who she is, but she is not my daughter, and I would have done anything to get her back. When I got here, I felt miserable. I felt like my life was over at 18. I felt like I should just not wake up because there's no point. I felt my life was over, but it, it really had just, it was just beginning. I finally felt like in the meetings that I was home. Well, I'd like to talk today about 
the shame that you felt uh, about being an alcoholic woman? I think it's really important that Mrs. Ford really wanted it to be gender specific because the shame and the guilt and the feelings we feel are totally different than with the men. And um, I felt safe, the safest I felt was in the women's groups. When I was born, I thought everybody else got the secret of life and knew how to live life. And I forgot to get the instructions. And somehow I felt because I didn't get those instructions that I was guilty of something. The things I had thought that I've never told anybody before, they thought that. Who told them I thought that? You know, they, they thought, they felt how I felt. My life now is unbelievable. My family and I are closer than we've ever been. They trust me, they have their daughter back. They've never seen such a change in their daughter. You know, it's like night and day. I believe the Betty Ford Center saved my daughter's life. And to think about where she would be right now is is unthinkable as a parent. Um, you know, you always grow up with dreams for your kids, and you want them to have a better life than you've had. And um, to not have answers and to feel like you're groping in the dark was very difficult, but to see that we had a place to take her, somewhere to go with answers, um, I think it saved our lives too. It's like a dream. I'm finishing design school. I'm going to graduate in four months. I never thought I could do that. I never thought my life could be this good. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Ford. Thank you, Betty Ford Center, and for all who support and engage in the work uh, that it, it transforms lives. And thank you for helping us get our daughter back. Thank you so much for your courage, your determination, and just for never giving up. Um, you're one of my heroes, and um, coming here has changed my life forever, and I'm just eternally grateful. Those most hurt by alcoholism and drug addiction are often the most innocent. In 1992, the Betty Ford Center's children's program opened its doors, and it continues to be one of Mrs. Ford's proudest accomplishments. The center has grown in many ways. We have um, added programs, uh, additional programs for children who are members of alcoholic or drug addicted families. And that's a very positive step because we hope to break the chain that would possibly lead to their own addiction. We know if we don't treat younger children, they become the next generations that are dealing with this disease. The children's program would not be here without Mrs. Ford. She thought from the beginning that that made a huge difference. Alcoholism and drug addiction, they're a family disease. Everyone in the family gets hurt by it. And everyone in the family deserves help and their own recovery. My dad was drinking and we've had a few things where the police were involved. I didn't understand why he drank. I mean, it caused a lot of pain and worry and fear in our family, and I didn't understand why he would want to do that to us. Before I came here, it was really bad. I didn't really like it because I never saw my father. Before, my life was like just really sad. I mean, we are always fighting and just didn't even feel like my mom was really there. I used to get a lot of stomach aches from what would happen that night and stuff, so I'd always be up at the nurse's office and never in the classroom. One day when he was sitting outside and smoking, I asked him why he smokes, and he said, just because he's addicted to it. And I asked him, do you think you're ever going to stop it? He said he wouldn't stop because he's addicted. I just ran inside crying. <laughs> oh my hand, oh my hand. Got him. A real important part of the children's program here at the Betty Ford Center is that boys and girls, for the first time, truly get in their heart. They're not alone. To be in a room with other boys and girls and to hear other kids say, you know, I was embarrassed at school. I didn't want to bring friends over. I had stomach aches at night when my dad didn't come home. I was afraid my parents were going to divorce. For many boys and girls, it's like being home for the very first time. Yeah, when I first came to the children's program, it was nice. It was a lot of kids that had the same problems as I did. 
It helped me because then I'd know I wasn't the only kid that had a parent that was addicted. Well, let's take a look at our artwork. Mr. Jago, tell me about that picture. Lies. Who was lying? The dad. The dad. What's he lying about? That kid asked him, is he drinking? And he said no, but he really was. When we draw on the children's program, it's like um, talking about our feelings, but we just draw it down instead. It's easier to draw your feelings than to talk about them. I draw pictures of like what I think addiction looks like and what addiction can do. He just like ruins a kid's life, really. Letting the rocks out of the bag, that was one of the most memorable parts of the program for me. It's a really heavy bag and you don't know what's in it and you have to carry it across the room. We opened the bag up and found the rocks, which represented feelings. If you don't talk about your feelings, you're not going to really feel good about yourself because you're going to have them in just like the bag of rocks. Before I came here, I had a really big bag of rocks. This is a disease of silence, of secrecy, of shame, because nobody talks about it. Boys and girls, they sense something's not right. Sometimes they even ask, are you okay? And they're told yes. Kids see it, they're not okay. And so many boys and girls feel there's something wrong with them. I felt like it was my fault because I was the one being yelled at. So I figured, well, if it's not my fault, then why am I being yelled at? So it must be my fault. I thought it was my fault because um, when I asked him to stop, he said he wouldn't stop. So I tried to change some things, but nothing helped. Jerry told me that it wasn't my fault, that my mom was being trapped by addiction, and he was telling her to do a lot of stuff, and that it wasn't my fault. It was just the addiction telling her to yell at me. So it wasn't really, she wasn't truly yelling at me from her heart. Knowing that it wasn't my fault and that there was nothing I could do, it was his choice. And I felt a little better about myself as well because I knew there was nothing wrong with me. Amanda, let's take a look. What does it say? Recovery is beautiful. I'm definitely happy now that she's recovered because we get to do so much more together and it's just we're having a better life. And there's my queen. And I think I can use that. Yeah, I feel like our relationship was kind of like this movie um, where it was called Freaky Friday where the mom becomes the daughter and the daughter becomes the mom where I became the parent and she became like the kid. So, and then at the end they switched back. But that's okay, we both won. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ford, for having this program. You've really brought my mom, brought my mom and me closer together, and we're just a lot happier. And I'm really thankful for all the people here, and for you, and for just starting this whole program. I would like to thank you for um, giving my family back our lives, um, for taking the pain away, and um, for giving my life back because I know now how bad alcohol and drugs are, and I will never, ever do them. Mrs. Ford has always been committed to the idea that treatment shouldn't end once a patient leaves the campus of the Betty Ford Center. Today, the center stays connected with former patients through several alumni and aftercare programs. So Mrs. Ford wants to make sure that the alumni, once they leave the Betty Ford Center, are, st are still able to be connected and we do that around the country in various formats. We have uh, over 50 chapter meetings now where people are able to meet together on a regular basis to uh, maintain their own support systems. I, I think there's definitely a special bond that the alums have. I mean, I think, I think having gone through that program and knowing what it's like to work from early in the morning till late at night, um, and, and having experienced some of that serenity and, and peace that is there at the center. I mean, it's a really special, special place. And I think that people that walk away from that really share that. There's just something about that bond you get when you start your life over here. And then you leave and you go out in the real world and you have your job and you have your family, but you still have that connection with someone that knows how you felt when you took your first steps out of here. There's just, it's indescribable, the bond that 
that we've built here. I think the whole alumni contact program is one of the greatest things that the center does. I mean, for, for me, it was, it was my way to, to transition from the center and residential treatment into Alcoholics Anonymous and the recovery community in my area. One of the things that was also really helpful for me in my sobriety when I was new getting out of the center is the Focus Continuing Care program where they call once a month to just kind of check on your progress. It, it was kind of like an accountability. Checking in to see how you're doing. After I left the center, um, I still had someone call me um, every month. I couldn't believe they didn't stop, you know, when I wasn't doing all the right things, but they still called and kept in contact. It was really crucial to me staying sober. I'm still in touch with that person today. It was her birthday three days ago, <laughs> so I called her. So it's ways we can reach out. These things make Mrs. Ford extremely gratified that the impact goes way beyond just the walls of the center. I'm just grateful that you were willing to come forward with your disease and to set up this program that has helped so many people after you. And God bless you and your family, thank you. The Betty Ford Center continues to grow and innovate, and the center now offers patients a 90-day off-campus program called Residential Day Treatment, or RDT. The challenge we have going forward, I think, is to begin to shift addiction treatment at the Betty Ford Center from our acute model of igniting and stabilizing recovery to really the process of sustaining and nurturing long-term recovery for years into that recovery process to reduce relapse rates. And I think Betty Ford's in a unique position to be able to create models that can be emulated by other organizations around the country to do just that. And so today, the Betty Ford Center not only has its traditional 30-day inpatient program and its intensive outpatient, but it also has these longer-term programs. What that's allowed us to do is truly place patients in the program that best fits them. I just felt like looking back now I can say that the, the RDT program for me was the perfect venue for me to, to allow recovery to start working in my life. Um, I felt like you know the counselors and the, the curriculum and the format and the venue even was uh, the perfect combination for this alcoholic to finally gain some willingness to, to do you know what was suggested. Mrs. Ford, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for giving me this incredible start at life. I can tell you that when I think about the ripple effect that's happened as a result of you starting the center, and I look at just how many people that I have come in contact with personally that have had their lives enriched as a result of, of sobriety and recovery, I can't tell you how grateful I am for everything that you've done for me and countless others. Thank you so much. And, Congratulations on 25 wonderful years. The newest program on the Betty Ford campus is called Clinical Diagnostic Evaluation. The Clinical Diagnostic Evaluation Program was a program that we really developed as a result of increasing the quality of our psychiatric staff, which was something we had really needed to do here. What that allowed us to do was bring in addiction psychiatrists to complement addiction physicians, along with counselors and psychologists and others, and to offer a short-term evaluation. Luella, what, what's your understanding of why you're here? Um, I'm here because um, Jimmy has been, um, his drinking's been out of control, and um, it's really starting to affect our family. I think the whole thing was rather over-dramatized. I may have a drink now and then or whatever, and you know, my wife has asked me to come here, and uh, I'm willing to check it out. With some people, offering them a two to two and a half day evaluation is something many people would agree to who aren't ready to agree to 30 days. It takes place over a two to three day period. It's a very, very intensive uh, experience for the uh, people involved and yet has a very satisfactory and uh, uh, successful outcome in terms of being able to help people to uh, accept the fact that they do have the disease of addiction and become prepared to do something about it. For 25 years, the Betty Ford Center has been the gold standard for the treatment of alcoholism and drug addiction. 
and Mrs. Ford's spirit of innovation and excellence continues today. I think the greatest legacy will be that we will have women who will be continuing to, re to recover uh, for coming decades, who, who will do so because of a legacy of hope that was initiated in 1978 by Mrs. Ford. Mrs. Ford uh, is a living um, message, a, a, a living embodiment uh, of the dignity of recovery. Uh, and that is a, a phenomenal uh, contribution. Uh, it's a beacon. Uh, for, for everybody in uh, the addiction field. Uh, that, uh, that dignity changes the experience for, for the nation, really. I think she'll be known for, you know, turning breast cancer around back in the 70s, and I think she'll have an incredible impact over time with alcoholism and drug addiction. I said to people when we first opened our doors, I hope we have five, six, seven years of a very healthy and involved Mrs. Ford, Betty Ford as chairman, as the involved co-founder of this center to kind of get us going the right way and being part of everything we do. The fact that 25 years later, Mrs. Ford is still part of everything we do is amazing. And it really affects the day-to-day -day existence and life at the Betty Ford Center. Thank you, my dear, dear friend, Betty Ford, a true pioneer who changed the face of alcoholism treatment in our world forever. You are a dear. Mrs. Ford, I think you the most courageous people, person I never have the opportunity to meet in my whole life. And forever, I will be indebted to you. Mom, um... I just, there's, there's not enough words to thank you for what you've done for our family and um, what you did to change the face of alcoholism, um, to change hundreds and thousands of people's lives, and probably most important, what you did to change my life. I think that you have changed the pattern of women around the world by your honesty and your sincerity. You change the way we think about breast cancer. You change the way we think about drug and alcohol addiction. You even change the way we think about dancers and models. In your case, they can be beautiful and highly intelligent. And I appreciate and love your passion for recovery and your commitment to the recovery process. Mrs. Ford, I just want to thank you for my new life and just want to tell you how much I appreciate all you have done for Betty Ford and I just want to say congratulations for 25 years. Thank you for all you have done for women. Um, and I'm one of those women who probably wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for uh, you and women like you who have gone before me and shown me the way. All of us could be no prouder than we are right now at what you've achieved, not on your behalf, but on behalf of the people that you've helped there at the Betty Ford Center. Congratulations, Mrs. Ford, on 25 years of recovery and excellence. You have been such an inspiration in my life, and I know in many hundreds of lives of the people who've been patients here. Betty, George and I were so thrilled to be with you when you opened the Betty Ford Center, and it has grown so hugely, and more people are better off because of you and we both love you. And I would only add congratulations on this fantastic anniversary. Uh, you've given a lot to so many, uh, and I expect this will continue for a long, long time. We love you, congratulations. Your kindness, generosity, your vision, your unswerving commitment that children will have a place here at the Betty Ford Center, that they count, that they matter, for the thousands of boys and girls and the parents who've come here in the nine years that I have been here, they can't say this right now. Allow me to say it for them. Thank you. You're such an inspiration to, uh, to our family and to the, the rest of this uh, country. And so we wish you uh, all the best and uh, we just give you our love uh, completely. 
yes, you were the president and first lady, but you might as well have been living next door. You've allowed so many women to, to seek treatment. All of your support for women's addiction treatment has been immensely valuable. You've really healed my life and many people I love around me, and I wish you all the best. Congratulations on 25 years. I want to congratulate you and everyone there at the center on the 25th anniversary and what it means in terms of what you have accomplished in helping so many, many thousands of people. Congratulations, Betty, on the 25th anniversary of the Betty Ford Center and on the so many lives that you have touched and blessed through your work there. Um, it, you're an inspiration to me and to all Americans. I think especially to women, though, we all love you. Your willingness and courage to come forward and speak about this disease helped me to seek treatment. And your courage and dedication to quality care for everyone is inspiring to me. Best wishes to you uh, for the coming years, uh, building on the incredible success of the Betty Ford Center during this last quarter century. Thank you for your friendship and for all you've done for our country. Thank you, Mom. I love you. I'm so proud that I can do what I've done at the Betty Ford Center and take over for you. But anytime you want it back, it's all yours. I'll step down for you this time. Love ya. And Mrs. Ford, we want you to know from the bottom of our hearts that we all love you. Thank you for accepting me as a person. Thank you for all you transported and transpired to me, uh, showed me how to conduct myself with class, if I can do that as a gentleman. The world as a whole is a much better place for your courage and standing up for recovery. Thank you very much. Mrs. Ford, if I could speak for all the children and all the families that have received help here, my heart would be so full to thank you. Mrs. Ford, I know that I speak for millions of Americans in saying thank you for being who you are, for being as honest as you have been about your life experiences and about using those as a platform to help millions of Americans make their own lives better. Betty Bloomer, whoever thought that I would be here with you at a time like this, bless your heart for being my friend through thick and thin all these 81 years. Congratulations, Mom. We love you. Thank you, Mrs. Ford. I love you lots, and you done good.